lives and breathes. We have a data sufficiency question. So everyone tell me, what is the first thing we do when we see a data sufficiency question? We change the question's answer choices to one, two, 10. First one is sufficient, second one is sufficient, together they are sufficient, either of them are sufficient, neither of them are sufficient. Let's take a look at this question. At what price did the salesman sell a car? So is this a data sufficiency yes, no question? I don't think so, it isn't. They're just asking at what price did the salesman sell a car? So let's see. To figure out the price of what you sell a car, get these down again. Great, so let's take a look at statement one and we'll say that the sales price of the car is S for the sales price. The salesman's gross profit on the car was 10% of the price at which the car, at the salesman sold the car. So if we say that, um, you know, G is, uh, let's actually say that uh, P is profit, we have S is sales and C is the cost of the car. Sales price and the profit. So there's a simple equation, right? If we're going to be in the business world, we should know that profit is equal to what? The sales cost, the sales price minus the cost. So that's what the profit is. But they also tell us in statement one here that the salesman's gross profit on the car was 10% of the price at which the salesman sold the car. So he's telling us that the profit was 10% or 0.1 of the price or of the sale price. So we already have two equations here. We have this equation that we know, which is just basic that the profit on anything is the what you sold it for minus what it cost you. The statement one tells us that the profit was actually 10% of the sales cost. And the question is, at what price did the salesman sell the car? So remember, they're trying to find out what S is. The question is, is this enough information for me to know what S is? So I know I can plug in one S over here, but I don't get a value for C. I have P, I have three unknowns, two equations. I don't think this works for us. What do you think, Jake? Not with three variables. Not with three variables. So if we can get rid of the first statement, that means we can also get rid of E. If one is not good, then either of them can't be good. Let's work the second statement. Whoops, I don't want to pick that. Let's work the second statement, number two. The price at which the salesman sold the car was $40 more than the salesman's cost of the car. So. The price, which they said was S, the, the price of the sale of the car, was $40 more than the cost. So if we say the cost plus 40, then we have the sale price of it. And again, they're asking us what, at what price did the salesman sell a car? Ignoring number one, if all we know is this, we have two unknowns and one equation, I don't think that's enough for us to figure out what the sales price is. So we can get rid of two as well. So either we can put these two statements together and answer it and have sufficient data, or even together they're not sufficient and we would need more information. Now, let's see what we have here. If we look at this as all of these equations are valid, what we have are three unknowns, three equations, do we have enough information to figure out this question, Jake, or do we need to actually sit there and solve it? We don't need to solve it with a data sufficiency. We don't need to solve it in a data sufficiency. They're not asking us for the actual number. They're just asking us if we know the price the salesman sold the car. We can plug in these equations into each other and end up solving uh, and actually getting the answer. If you want to do that, you can view the explanation of this question if you're uh, working in Grokit, but I'm pretty sure the answer is C. That's correct. And on the GMAT, if you have the time to work these questions, it certainly doesn't hurt, but you need to know that the, how many equations and how many unknowns give you 
enough information. You just have to make sure that you don't have two equations that are the same because they don't count. So for example, x plus y equals 2 and 2x plus 2y equals 4. Are these the same equation? They're just scaled. They're just scaled. Everything is twice the size. So this isn't two equations, two unknowns. This is one equation because I can simplify and divide everything by 2 and I get the same equation. This is two unknowns, one equation. So just be careful you're not in a situation like that. So great, 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 great. Let's keep going and talk about number properties of integers. We covered some of these, but some of these we didn't. And again, I just want to make sure that we have our bases, bases covered so that we can build on top of these. And more importantly, uh, the GMAT doesn't test us on everything. It tests us on some things. And it's important that we just know what basic points are covered and which ones aren't and which complicated and advanced points are covered and which ones aren't. Uh, is there trig? Is there calculus? No. Is there geometry? Yes. Is there probabilities? Yes. Um, these things are generally arbitrary, which subject matters they choose to cover. It's important that we know which ones they do and don't. Um, just some basic things to remember. Negatives times negatives. Positives times positives. Uh, negative times positives. Even in odd numbers, adding and subtracting them, multiplying them. Uh, we talked a little bit about prime numbers having exactly two factors. One doesn't count. Two is the only even prime number. So if the GMAT is asking a question about even prime numbers, there's not one way far off down there uh, past one billion and ten bazillion. Uh, two is the only even prime number. And we also listed these properties of zero. Uh, it's neither positive nor negative. It is even. 0 times x is 0, adding 0 to something gets nothing, and always remember that x versus any value divided by 0 is going to be undefined. And if you have the official guide, we had some feedback from folks that were using the official guide to study with, and uh, so we're, where, where we can, we will incorporate some information on where in the GMAT official guides and which official guide. So official guide 11, page 112, and in uh, official guide 12, page 112, you'll see some information on this as well. So let's actually take a look at a question that covers number properties here. Looks like we have a data sufficiency question. What is the first thing we do on data sufficiency questions? Everybody tell me. Yes, very good. 1, 2, 10. Nice. Go ahead and read the question and we'll work it together in just a second. Great, so this question, is 210 divided by x also an integer? I think we have a yes, no data sufficiency question here. So as I recall, a lot of times on these I try different values. I try to prove it one way, prove it the other way and eliminate that answer. So this is why I always note whether it's a yes, no data sufficiency question. Given that x is an integer and x is positive, is 210 divided by x also an integer? So they told us that x is a prime number. OK, so let's take some values. I can't use 0, I can't use 1, but 2 is pretty simple. And it's an even prime number, so it's sort of unique. Let's try it. X is a prime number. I've met that condition. X is 2. Given that X is an integer and X is positive, I've also met that condition. So this is a valid number to try. Is 210 divided by X also an integer? Uh, even divided by an integer, I think we'll get a yes. Great. So now I'm going to try and disprove this. Is there some number that we can plug in here for X that meets our criteria but does not give us an integer? Well, let's just stick with simple low, uh, num no, low value prime numbers. So let's try 3. So 210 divided by 3, does that give us an integer? Yes. Let's try one more. Can anyone give me an integer that would work here in terms of giving us a value that was no? A pretty low number? 
11 should work. If we plug 210 divided by 11, we're not going to get an integer. We'll get a no. We can eliminate one. We can eliminate either. Very good, very good. So let's take a look at the second statement. In the second statement, we have x is less than 8. So x could be, uh, it has to be an integer and it has to be positive. So it can't be 0 because uh, 0 is an integer, but it's not positive. Uh, it could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 3, it could be 4, it could be 5, it could be 6, it could be 7. It could not be 8 because x is less than 8, not less than or equal to. And it can't be 7.9 because they said x is an integer. So we've got the set covered 1 through 7 inclusive. And they're asking us, is 210 divided by x an integer? Well, if I use 1, I will get an integer. If I use 2, I will get an integer. If I use 3, I will get an integer. If I use 4, will I get an integer? Well, maybe you could try dividing it by 2 and seeing where that gets you. Well, if I divide it by 2, I get 105. And then divide again by 2. Don't get an integer. So let's say that's an x. I could stop right now and get rid of 2, but just to double check, and we only have a couple more, uh, 210 is divisible by 5. 210 is divisible by 6. Mm -hmm. Do I need to know? I don't need to know. So at this point on GMAT, I have a decision to make. Do I try it out or do I not? For my sense, um, I've found one value that blows this out. So can I get rid of 2, Jake, or do I have to have more than one that doesn't work? If 2 is contradictory, then you can get rid of it. Okay, Doug. So we get rid of 2, and now we can either put them together or neither of them satisfy. So let's take a look. We need a number that is both prime and less than 8. So 1 is not prime and if you thought it was, this question wouldn't, could, could nab you. Uh, 2 is prime and it's less than 8. 3 is prime and it's less than 8. 4 is not prime. 5 is prime and it's less than 8. 6 is not prime. 7 is prime. So I've checked these all off already. I don't need to check 6 because I eliminated it here as not being prime. I just need to check 7. And 7 into 21 is 3, so this is going to work just fine. And it looks like if I take both of these things into consideration, uh, I should be able to always say that 210, that yes, 210 divided by x, if x is 2, 3, 5, or 7, is always going to be an integer. I hope. Let's see. Great. So this was a question that was covering our understanding of prime numbers, our understanding of integers, and our ability to manage a data sufficiency yes, no question. So several things going on, both in the process that we're using to handle the questions, but then also in the content that the question is uh, asking us about. Great. Let's talk a little bit more uh, and move out of number properties into some uh, algebra and functions and quadratics. Memorize the following equations, or rather the, you know, the following conversions. It will save you time. Um, we want to have these on the tips of our brain when we're taking the GMAT. It'll help us work through the questions that they give us a little bit more quickly and just remember that these two things do not equal each other. This is not how it's distributed. So x plus y quantity squared will break down into this. x minus y quantity squared will break down into this and these guys together as well. So we're actually gonna, I'm gonna skip this question and we'll work another one of these at the beginning of next week. Um, 